Are you ready for the Word? Doing a series of lessons about kingdom principles. Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, Jesus said, Jesus answered and said, And then, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Apparently, there's a whole kingdom principles here that we need to learn to operate under and in. Jesus didn't talk about a religion. He talked about a kingdom. You know, Matthew chapter 3, 11, Jesus answered, because it has given you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 4, 17, for this time Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he goes on and on and on. He talks about the kingdom of heaven. And then we talked about how God has... Um, wants to bless us generationally. And I talked to you about how 53 years after David's death, God was still working on David's part because he was sold out to God. Why would that just stop at King David? I believe it's for everybody that sells out to God. If it's in the Bible, it's for you. And it's not just like, well, I'm just going to bless David here. I believe it's for everybody that sells out to God. There's something about a generational thing. 1 Kings 15, 86 years after David's death, God was still working on David's behalf. 156 years in 2 Kings chapter 8, 313 years. And we talked about last week, and I want to just reiterate this because it's so important, but, you know, we don't do this kingdom principle thing. We don't do it in a vacuum. We don't do it by ourselves. When you try to do it by yourselves, you mess up. How many of you figured out that you've got to have extra help to be to do the kingdom of God thing. He made it that way. We're a body of believers, and, and we're not all gifted in, in areas. And, and God holds things and says, look, I'm going to give you this much, but I'm not going to give you that because you're going to need so-and-so to do this in your life. So you're going to have to gather around a body because if you were all on all, you'd be Superman, and there'd be no need of Jesus. So we're all a body of believers. I don't do very many things well, but what I do do well, I try to do them very well. But I don't do a lot of things well. A couple things. Can't remember what the second one is. <laughs> in Hebrews chapter 7, in the last part of Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 7, I'm just for the sake of time, I don't want to read 1 through 7, but he talks about Abram, Abram paying tithe to Melchizedek. And then it says, the last part of the last, uh, 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 verse 1 through 7, and then verse 7, the last part there, he says, Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. He received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Generally speaking, God reserves your blessing with somebody else. You may have a promise of God, but you need a blessing. Think about that with parents and authority figures in your life. So vitally important. And we talked about how we, uh, Galatians 3.13 talks about how Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, where his written curse is everyone who hangs on upon the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Well, I qualify, you qualify, you're a Gentile. So we want the blessing of God. Well, what's our, the blessing of Abraham? Well, what's the blessing of Abraham? Uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. You just go back and find out where Abraham was blessed. There's only one place where ever he was ever pronounced the blessing, and it was in Genesis chapter 14. And that's where we want to pick up today, Genesis chapter 14. And verse 14 through 20 says, Now Abram, his name was Abram at the time. God didn't change his name until future chapters here to Abraham, which means the father of many nations. Verse 14 says, Now Abram heard that his brother was taken captive as an arms, 318 trained servants who were born in his own house, and he went pursued as far as Dan. He divided his forces against the night, and, he, and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. We brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother and Lot and his goods and wells, all the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaba, that is the king's valley, and he's returned from the defeat of Shandalorim and the kings who were with him. And then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he priest of the Most High God, and blessed Abram, Most High, and he said these, blessed Abram of Most High, or blessed Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, Blessed be God most high, and he's delivered your enemies into your hands. So there's a threefold blessing here, and I want to pick up where we best off last week, that the first one we want to talk about is of the word most high is the elevated one, or it's used in this terminology in the Hebrew, it's used in this terminology. I sound like a Hebrew scholar, but I really know nothing about the Hebrew other than I can read something after somebody Hebrew. 
But it bears, virtually basically says as God was basically, or, or Melchizedek was pronouncing a blessing, and he said, you're now of Abram, of God Most High, or of the Elevated One, and it literally means you get to switch families. You get to change your DNA structure. I don't know if that means something to you, but I was studying DNA this week. I, you know, just preparing for this message, and I was studying DNA. It's very interesting. They took these little mice. Now, you're going to love this. Are you going to love this, or are you going to hate this? But, you know, we always talk about, you know, their DNA, you know, and you've got to go check out. When you go to the doctor, they say, well, is there, is there a heart trouble in your, in your family history? And you say, oh, yes or no, and because it's kind of a, an indicator of what you might be fighting. Do you have any cancer in your family history? Because it might be an indicator of what you're fighting. So they took these mice, and they're doing these tests on these mice to check DNA. And they took a mouse, and they, every time that they would introduce a, a cherry blossom smell, they would do something negative to the mouse. And pretty soon, the mouse became afraid of cherry blossom smell. Every time there was a cherry blossom smell, the mouse would freak out and go, ah, and run away because of the cherry blossom smell. And so then they bred these mice, and it was interesting that the offspring of these mice were also afraid of cherry blossom smells, indicating that DNA isn't just a physical thing, but can be a learned behavior that can be passed on from generations to generations. Now you can sit there and say, that's great. Or you say, oh my God. <laughs> They've proven that our DNA is kind of, you know, so we say that we kind of throw this myth out, we kind of throw this thing out that somehow alcoholism doesn't run in the family. But it's a learned behavior in one generation can pass it on to the next generation. Or drug addiction doesn't run in a family. Or how about this one? How about consistent poverty in a person's life? And it can, it can actually be passed on to generation to generation. So we've got to do something about that. Man, I want to just think about this. Uh, Adam and Blake, why don't you guys come up here and, and uh, let me turn off my mic just a second because I've got to give them some instructions. <laughs> I think, there we go. So what I want you to do is, Blake, I want you to take this and maybe just go over there, and I want you to write down all your sins and your faults. <laughs> and, uh, and Adam, I want you to go over here and write down all your sins and your faults. Now, this is just an hour, about an hour of service, and I've got only a half hour left, so if, if it takes that long, just go ahead and just write some stuff down there, because we want these people. And then we're going to read them, of course, out loud. And... Uh, <laughs> And, yeah, do you need your wife's help? Because your wives can help you out. <laughs> she's where? Oh, she's in the parent lounge. Holly, if you're watching, if, uh, if Adam misses anything on sins, then we'll call you in here and have you, have you take care of stuff. So let's open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And then... I don't want to belabor the point because it only take a couple of them, but you guys come and bring them, bring them back to me now. and Let me just kind of read after some of the stuff you guys got. Oh, my God. <laughs> and just got to stand right here and right here. So No, Blake, over here. Okay, well. Does Cassidy know that? <laughs> Adam, does... Holly, know about this one? She, you know, she doesn't know about that one? Yeah. You guys are a mess. Mm -hmm. Blake, you managed to write down a lot of stuff in that short amount of time, and, and it looks like you guys could have gone on and on and on. But, you know, I, I don't think that um, with all this stuff that's wrong with your life, I don't think I'm going to be able to help you. I, I, don't, think, I don't think I'm going to be able to help you. I think that you're, um, from what I can see, you're done. 
I mean, there is literally no hope for you. So when you serve a holy God, there's no way that you can, we can deal with this stuff. There's just, this is too, this is too much. I can't, I mean, now these guys, these guys are both pastoral staff and walking with God. And we got some crazy stuff going on right here. We don't really, but you know, anyway, so, (laughs) but you get the, you get the point. So I think what we're going to have to do, come here, you guys, I think what, I got a plan. This is my plan. Why don't we just start over and kill both of you? <laughs> so if I kill you, then all the sin that you've had in your life, then you won't have to have deal with that anymore. And you ever seen a dead man ever pay his bills? You ever seen a dead man ever be responsible for his sin? So maybe what we need to do is just start over kill you and then resurrect you a new person maybe that would maybe that would help because it's you're, you're far beyond help i can't help you so so I, I think we just need to start over with you two and just just go ahead and uh kill both of you and then hopefully we, you know maybe we'll raise you from the dead maybe we won't but um anyway thanks guys thanks guys so i think in our in our walk with god We try to get better. We try to do a remodel on the house. And God looks at us and says, eh, we just need to bulldoze the whole thing and start over. So let's just bulldoze the whole thing. Let's just kill these people and let's start over. So Paul said stuff like this. He said in Galatians 2.20, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. If you want to turn over there, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, notice in Christ, he's a new creation. That guy doesn't exist anymore. That, you, died on the, you died with Jesus on the cross. Because you're too messed up. There's nothing you can do to approach a holy God. There's nothing you can do. So he said, well, let's just kill these guys and start over. So God, in Christ Jesus, kills us and then gets to raise us up anew in newness of life. He says, I'm a new creature in Christ. He says, a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciling, that is, in God, who was in Christ, reconciled the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Not imputing is a a, uh, um, term, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, uh, uh, Checkbook stuff, uh, reckoning, whatever. Reconciling, Reconciling, that's what I'm trying to say. Not reconciling their sins to them. And it's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, though God pleading through us and implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we're just too much of a mess. If we have one sin in our life, we can't approach a holy God. So he said, look, I just got to kill these guys and start over. So I'm going to send Jesus to the cross. He's going to be their substitutionary work. And when they understand and they identify in me in Christ, every cancer can't can't stay in, in the body of a person that identifies in Christ poverty and sickness and disease and all those kind of things and mental anguish and guilt and shame and all those kind of things are broken and left through the cross and where he's not trying to repair us any longer he just said i gotta tear this sucker down and make a new one so you get the benefit of a new creation man i needed that i don't know about you but i needed that i told you that last week how my family tree was messed up come from a long line of perverts and alcoholics and I needed to break the alcoholic thing in my, my family tree. I needed to break that thing. And so I rose anew. Man, I rose anew, and I broke that thing over my life. And I'm no longer that part of that life anymore. That thing's been broken over me, and it's been broken over you if you're in Christ. And you've been struggling your whole life to try to overcome something that's already been overcome because he killed you. He killed you and said, look, you don't have to pay the penalty for that anymore because you're dead. 
So things like this, he says, I, I, I love this, uh, I love this scripture here, or, or actually it's a, um, you know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, says, for though him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You ever watch that show? I, I watched it a few times. Man, what a crazy show this is. You ever watch that Mari, Mari Povich show? <laughs> Some of you do, probably. Some of you got it on your DVR. That thing's crazy. The whole show is based around who's your daddy. And, 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 and so I, I guess it's, I don't, I don't watch it, but I mean, I, I've watched it a few times and I thought, this is crazy. So they bring these guys in and they bring this gal and she says, hey, well, you're the father. And he says, I ain't either the father. And Maury pulls out the thing and says, the DNA test, he says, you are the father. And that's what the whole show is about. And it's kind of sad. It's kind of sad because what they might say, you are not the father. And the guy cheers with his new girlfriend. And they walk out and goes, ah! She doesn't know who the father is. And the trouble with mankind, we don't know who our father is. Who's your daddy? When you're a new creature in Christ, you need to realize that you're no longer of Bob Johnson. You're of the elevated one, king of kings and lord of lords. I check my DNA. I check my DNA. It's birthed out of heaven. My history goes back all the way to heaven now. And because I got killed at the cross. I got killed in 1978. They killed me. I, I said, Jesus, come be my personal Savior. And everything that was ever in my family tree got broken right there in the name of Jesus. Now the flesh starts to come up. And the Bible says you've got to put on the new man. And the old man will try to rise up and act like the old. The new, and tries to do all this kind of stuff. So you've got to renew your mind and do all those kind of things. But we're not renewing our mind to try to get something. We're new, renewing our mind to try to understand what's already taken place. So that we can partake of what it is already. So what's your situation? you holding on to? Man, I just can't seem to break this addiction. I can't seem to break this eating habit. I can't seem to break this anger habit. I can't seem to break this. I'm telling you, it's already been broken. You just need to realize, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? And so when I think about all the stuff that tries to come back on me and start speaking to me and tell me this and all this kind of stuff, and I start acting like my dad and all those kind of stuff, I say, wait a minute. You know, I love my earthly father. I loved him. He was an alcoholic, but I loved him. And I appreciated him, and I, you know, he paid bills and child support, and he did all this, he left us an inheritance. He was a good man as far as that goes, but he didn't know how to have a relationship because he's drunk all the time. So I had to break something. I had to break that. I had to, I had to identify with the right father, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And now I'm cut from the stock of God. I'm pretty amazing, if you don't know that. I'm pretty amazing because I have an amazing father. And he took me in when it didn't seem like I should be taken in. And I didn't deserve any of this stuff. But I'm cut from the stock of God. So I just hold my head high no matter how I feel. No matter all the stuff that tries to come in. I just hold my head high and say, I'm cut from the stock of God. Are you getting this today? He said, that I, there's, uh, somebody wrote this. He says, beloved, your life is like that when you were born again. You stepped out of the family line you were born into, leaving Every genetic malfunction, malformation, every physical illness, every inherited disease, every besetting sin, and you stepped into the bloodline of a new father. As he is right now, so are you, without sin, without the effects of sin, without any desire to sin, without sickness or disease, without fear, without despair, without discouragement, without disappointment, completely whole, completely at peace, completely accepted, completely loved, complete. He traded his blood for yours, his life for yours, his wholeness for your brokenness, his heaven for your hell right here, right now. He left you a letter to tell you his love never fails. You got to believe that. You got to set your faith. You got to you got to believe that about him. And then he said this. He said the next blessing he talks about because this will go with it. And then we're going to pray for some people. The next blessing he talked about was, you have authority over your enemies. You have authority over your enemies. In uh, in First John chapter five and verse nineteen. Now you have to understand that we fight an enemy over this. Now we're not fighting an enemy to try to get him defeated because Jesus already defeated. 
we're fighting for is for our thick brain to understand what Jesus has already done. Ephesians 1 says, pray that you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation upon him, on you. But look at this. The enemy does control things, and he does influence us. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, it says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, Whose minds of the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious light of, the, of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You ever think that the world might be blinded? Just get in this political season, and you'll figure out that the world's blinded. You sit there and you say, how could, it, what, what, uh, what, how could, what, how could that happen? And you've got to remember, people walk under the blinders uh, uh, of an evil one that's on the earth. And he's blinding us. What is he blinding? That's his only uh, resources, his only recourse he has in your life to blind you so you don't see what God has for you. But we have authority over these things. Jesus has already paid the price. We have a new father, a new heaven, new earth, all those kinds. Of, we have all that kind of stuff. He's paid the price for you, and we need to realize that we have authority over the devil. We have authority in, really, we have authority in three worlds. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven and those in earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of the Father. Notice he says, he says every knee should bow of those in heaven, those in earth, and those under the earth. Every, every knee shall bow, every name, every knee shall bow, and you're in seated at the same place. Ephesians tells you you're seated at the same place at the right hand of the Father. The enemy comes in and he starts talking to you, and he starts whispering these words to you. You're no good. You're unworthy. You can't do that. You'll never accomplish anything. You'll never be that. And, or sickness tries to attach itself to your body, and the doctors give you a bad report and say, well, Stay there, you're going to die. And you need to realize it's a fight, but it's a fight just to get your thick skull to believe what Jesus has already done for you. Because the victory is already ours. He's already paid the price. You're not begging God to heal you. He's already done it. We're just understanding because there's the enemy comes against us with blinders to try to convince us that we don't have what we have. You have authority over your enemies. You're seated at the, at the highest place of authority th there is. Now, this isn't religious. This is Bible. You're seated at the right hand of the Father, seated at the highest place of authority there is. And yet, Jesus gave the keys, of the, maybe he gave us the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and he, and he said part of this kingdom heaven principle, remember we read this verse, same verse, or first verse, he said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. I wonder, and I'm not trying to criticize, don't get me wrong now, because it's a fight down here. This is a, there's a, a powerful force that we fight. But I wonder if some of us, just by lack of knowledge, have just put up with stuff we shouldn't be putting up with. It's kind of like just one day. You walk in your household, and things are just disorder in your household, and finally one day you walk in and said, I've had enough. That's it. We're not going to put up with that any longer. And it's amazing the way things change when that happens. And yet stuff comes on us, and we put up with the thoughts and the intents of the enemy, and he talks to us, and he, he tells us all kinds of things. And we say, yeah, I know. I know, I know. I went out and blow it, and I'm so unworthy. And that's just the devil telling you you are something that you're really not. And we get this sin consciousness that weighs on us. If you, under, if you ever understand, if you, we ever get a hold of that Jesus has already made you righteous and there's nothing you can do to change that, he's made you righteous and he's seated you at the right hand of the Father. If you ever understand, if we ever, I don't even understand, I don't get it. I have to pray that prayer for me. Pray that the, the, the power of wisdom and, or the spirit of wisdom and revelation will be upon Glenn Johnson. The eyes of my understanding would be enlightened. I think that if he uh, unveiled it all to us at once, we would just be so blown away, we'd probably die of a heart attack because we'd be so excited about it. But when you're in Christ, my brothers and sisters, and you get to switch families, and you start saying that about yourself, 
Maybe the enemy to some of this is you came from a decent family. I didn't. I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm not criticizing my parents or anything like that, but divorce and alcoholism and all those kinds of things. It was easy for me to say, look, I've got to do something about this. I've got to change because there's an irresistible pull that's pulling me into my father's footsteps. I've I got to believe something. I've got to do something different. Maybe you have a great family. Maybe that's the enemy to God's best in your life is you're still pulling on the natural realm when really you could be pulling on the spiritual realm. There's prosperity for you, brothers and sisters. There's healing for you. There's a lack of guilt in our lives that's tormented so many of us for years. The enemy just plays havoc with you and turns you upside down with the guilt that he, because of something you did in your past. There's not a, there's, I don't, I'll tell you what, I'm going to guarantee you. Now, I don't know how that thing works all the time, but I've never seen a guilty man in the grave. When a man's dead and you reckon yourself dead and you understand that you've death, burial, and resurrection, that old man died, and you can live in that newness of life. And you have authority over the devil. You have authority over the devil. Someone said this. They said, you'll, you'll get in this life just what you believe God for, nothing more and nothing less. You're not begging God to heal. You're not begging God to prosper you. You're not begging God to give. Oh, God, please, would you do this for us? God just saying, I already did this thing, man. You just need to give some wisdom that this thing's already done. You need to take advantage of it because it's really the devil that's holding back on you. It's already finished. It's done. It's complete. It's over with. It's done. He sat down. That means when Jesus said this on the cross, he said, it is finished. It means everything you'll ever need, desire, want, or supply that you'll ever need has already been provided for you. And now we have to draw it out by faith and believe God. Behold, I give you authority, Luke ten nineteen, to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall I any, by any means hurt you. Romans five seventeen. for by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, that's Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to reemphasize this and then we're going to pray for some people. Is it easy? Is, are we on an easy track here that we just, this is easy to get? We just, we go out and we go, yeah, I, I, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Can't, yeah, uh, we've been trained so much by the world system that it takes a while to overcome this stuff. But the reality is when you understand who you are in Christ, you stand, the Bible says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Not the effectual fervent prayer of a beggar, but the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I remember a story, and I'm going to close, and then we're going to pray for some people. We're going to take our authority over sickness this morning, and, and we're going to take our authority over poverty this morning. We're going to take our authority over disease this morning, and we're going to take our authority over guilt this morning. We're going to take our authority over mental anguish and depression this morning and whatever name that you can name that's wrong with your life we're going to kick its butt this morning we're going to enforce satan's defeat i remember when i was first went to bible school i got off the airplane met these people you heard the story and uh they had an el camino to and this it was about 100 degrees out and they had an el camino with a kind of a canopy top on it and they had Bob, the wife Becky, and this girl that they had picked up at the airport. So where did that leave me but to sit in the back of the El Camino going to their place? And I'll never forget this. It was like it was, it was fire. It was just fire shut up in their bones. And they said, well, you'll have to ride in the back. And I used this term. I said, well, beggars can't be choosy. And they looked at me and said, you are not a beggar. And I went, Oh, I'm in a different world now. I'll never forget. He said, you're not a beggar. I mean, they, they, they almost, it was like with fire. They didn't say, you're not a beggar at all, Glenn. They just said, you are not a beggar. And I thought, okay, I don't know what that means right now, but I'm sure I'll figure that out. <laughs> and I figured it out. We're not the people that are just barely getting by. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. He says, when you're in Christ, he always causes you to triumph. Now, you're going to go through some stuff. 
in this world, you're going to have some tribulation. And, and it's not easy. It's not an easy road because he said, fight the good fight of faith. And if you think this stuff just comes on you and you just understand it overnight, it doesn't. But once you understand certain levels, financially and everything else, you get to a certain level, you just don't put up with that stuff anymore. And then you get to a certain level, and then you've got to fight for another level. And then you've got to fight for another level. And you've got to fight for another level. And you've got to fight. And it's a constant battle, constant fight. And that's why people die young a lot of times, because they just give up the fight. Because it's a battle that we have. But I'm telling you, the battle's already won. Jesus already paid the price for you. And he killed you and res res resurrected you. And your DNA, when you make Jesus Lord of your life, is in the stock of heaven. Now, I felt to do this this morning. Felt is a bad term. I sensed to do this. But if you have something that's holding on to your life, you have something that's plaguing you, guilt, shame, cancer. I'm telling you, it's under the blood. Jesus paid the price for it. Whatever it might be, then... We want to lay hands upon you. I say we because I'm going to tell you who's going to lay hands on you in just a second. And, and, they're, and we're going to pray for you. And we're going to agree with you. And we're going to enforce Satan's defeat because you're cut from the stock of God. And we, I believe today, you're, I believe that the healing power of God is going to flow in this place. And you're going to see some instantaneous miracles. You're going to see people healed as they go. You're going to see deliverance for people. You're going to see guilt come off of people because of abuse that they've had. And they've taken that abuse their whole lives. And that guilt and shame has been on them. And, and they don't even know why because it's the devil. It's a critter. We call them critters. But it's a critter that got in somebody. It's a demon spirit that come in. It's a spirit of shame that's got on people. And they didn't even have anything to do with it. But they've taken up the shame of that abuse. break that stuff in Jesus name you want prayer for anything I don't care what it is that's you want to say today's the day when I when they, they lay my hand when they lay their hands upon me when they lay their hands upon me I'll be different after this thing and the enemy will come back and you know the Bible says Satan comes immediately to steal the word sown in his heart before you can get down the aisle the enemy will start working on you to tell you you aren't what you really are and I'm telling you, God has no shame in the kingdom of God. I have, a lot, I have a lot of things to be shameful for. I have a lot of things to be shameful for. A lot of things that I did, my sexual activity before I was saved, my addiction activity before I was saved. I have a lot of things to be shameful for. But you know what? Glenn Johnson died in 1978, buried that sucker in the somewhere and now he rose again and there's no shame no condemnation no guilt no nothing and if it tries to come on me i just said tell the devil you know what every time you remind me of my past i'll just remind you of your future you want to break something off your life then you come up here and just stand right here just come up here and stand put your toes right against the stage right now or you want to break sickness off your life you want to break disease off your life you want to break shame off your life just come up here and just stand right against Right, right against that, the stage. All my Bible school students that aren't up here, I want my Bible school students to all come up on stage. All my Bible school students, all of my Bible school students to come up. Everybody in, our, in, in my Bible school. Come on, come up here on stage. All my Bible school students, come up here on stage. Everybody that's here in our Bible school, come on up. Come on, make your way up, make your way up. Come on, come on. You're righteous, man. You can walk, walk. And I want you just to lay your hands, and I want you to pray for each one of these people. I want you to just go lay hands on them, because these people are trained to pray. They're, just go lay your hands upon them right now, and just begin to pray for them. You might ask for what their request is, but whatever it might be, just pray. Just pray over them, and just believe God with them. Set your faith with them. Break the power. Come on, let's, let's pray. Let's, let's, let's agree in prayer. Let's, let's pray. Let's lift up our voices and pray. Let's lift up our voices and pray. Lift up our voices and pray. In the name of Jesus. Congregation, just speak over these people. Just say, sickness has no part in their life. Disease has no part in their life. Once you've prayed for one, then go to another one. If, once you take a little bit of time, then pray for another one. Disease has no part in their life. Sickness has no part in their life. Shame and guilt 
is under the blood of Jesus. Under the blood of Jesus. Break its power. Break its power right now. In the name of Jesus. Speak life to them. In the name of Jesus. Once you've been prayed for, you can go back to your seat. But if you haven't been prayed for, just wait right there. Somebody will pray with you and for you. In the name of Jesus. 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 Some people down here, if you guys, guys, come down here and pray. Here's a prayer request came in as we're up there. Job, 82-year-old grandma, sisters homeless, back issues, bronchitis, son's addictions, cousins to be cancer-free, healing for a hip, infertility, friends backslidden, peace after sister passed. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we stand as a righteous man. I stand as a righteous man. Not by what I've done, but by what Jesus did. You said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That's anybody who knows the name of Jesus. Anybody that's in Christ. We pray for each one of these requests. We call them healed, blessed, anointed, delivered. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep their hearts and minds by Christ Jesus. Don't see how long you can pray. See how short you can pray. Here's a prayer, prayer right here. In the name of Jesus, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father God, for deliverance today. I thank you, Father God, for the healing power of God. I thank you, Father God, for shame being broken off people's lives today. In the name of Jesus. Shame has to go right now. In the name of Jesus. And I see, uh, I see this. I see a little, I know this sounds a little strange, but I see a little demonic little spirit trying to hide around the corner that comes out every once in a while and speaks to you and just says, yeah, you'll never be forgiven for that. You'll never have that. You'll never do that. I bind that power of shame. I bind the power of the devil right now in the name of Jesus. Stand up with me, church. Let's just declare this. Stand up with me. Stand up with me. We're almost done. I bind the power of the devil in Jesus' name. Break its power in the name of Jesus. Break your power over poverty because, Father, you said in your word that we have abundantly, we're abundantly supplied as we give. We're abundantly supplied. We thank you for the healing power of God. Cancers and sicknesses and disease cannot stand to the name of Jesus. And we just give you praise and honor and glory for everything that's accomplished in our midst today. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that, would you just shout amen? Amen. amen. We love you guys. Have a